I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel. Do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate Rebels. You are listening to Moderate Rebels. I'm Ben Norton here with Max Blumenthal. And today we are joined by the Iranian-American activist Mazda Majidi. He is based in the Bay Area and he organizes with the Answer Coalition. That is the Act Now to Stop War and End Racism Answer Coalition. And we have a very interesting and timely topic today, Iran. There have been torrents and torrents of articles in media outlets throughout the world on the recent protests going on in Iran. We've seen what began as relatively small protests grow and expand throughout the country. There have been conflicting reports about the character of the protest. We'll be discussing that today. There have also been reports of extremely violent protests in which uh, armed protesters, which is the language media outlets used, have tried to storm military bases and try to seize police stations, Syria style, like we saw in 2011 there. So we're going to unpack exactly, you know, what is happening, what the roots are behind the protests, and then, of course, what the response has been from other countries throughout the world. As people living in the U.S., immediately we see that President Trump has tried to uh, exploit the protests, you know, using as an opportunity to call for regime change in Tehran. We have, of course, we've seen Saudi Arabia and Israel doing the same. So one of the things that you want to do in this episode is kind of talk about some of the media myths, of course, Everyone in corporate media right now supports the protests, and you have even a bunch of hawks who have relentlessly for years called for the U.S. and Israel to bomb Iran with utter disregard for civilian casualties, who now suddenly claim to be the best friends of the Iranian people. So we'll unpack, you know, how farcical a lot of this is. And we'll also talk about some of the different uh, opposition groups, because, you know, one of the things I also want to do is understand the kind of nuance of the political situation. Of course, there are legitimate protests against neoliberal policies, against rising inequality, against government repression, against a lack of rights for women and workers, etc. And, uh, of course, against the effects of U.S. sanctions on the Iranian economy, which have been very brutal. We also have to talk about the history of U.S. imperialism in Iran. The CIA overthrew Iran's elected government in 1953. And since Trump entered office, the CIA created an entire new program expressly devoted to regime change in Iran. Hopefully, we'll be able to address all of that in this episode. First, I think we'll hand the mic over to, to Mazda Majidi. He just published an excellent article in Liberation News called What to Make of Iran's Demonstration in which he articulates a very nuanced analysis of what's going on in the country. Uh, we will link to that article in the show notes for this episode, which can be found at moderaterebelsradio.com. And they can also be found at our Patreon page, that is patreon.com slash moderaterebels. But uh, let's go ahead and begin here. Uh, Mazda, what do you think of the situation? And can you talk a little bit about what you think about the Western media narrative and the political narrative surrounding these protests? And what are people getting wrong? Sure. Thanks, Ben. Thank you for having me. And I think, uh, you know, as an anti-war activist, uh, I know as well as, you know, uh, many of us that uh, when the U.S. is ready for um, either attacking a country, bombing a country, invading a country, or in any case, uh, planning for regime change, uh, the facts become a casualty. And I think in the case of um, the last week's coverage of developments of Iran, uh, there's so many falsehoods, so many misrepresentations, the whole narrative is so false that we have to take a good bit of time just kind of uh, peeling off layer after layer of all the things that uh, make it impossible to have a reasonable understanding of what's going on. Um, I'll start with the numbers. Uh, I mean, the number of people who participate in demonstrations is significant. I mean, here in the U.S., uh, uh, we know that, for example, our experience here in San Francisco is that the media, uh, and not just the, you know, different U.S. administrations, but even the media, for the most part, they it's almost like they have a kind of a training to underestimate the size of protests. Um, when it's against war or anything else that the uh, you know U.S. government uh, uh, deems necessary, like bombings and invasions and so forth. 
And we've had uh, cases here in San Francisco when we've had, uh, you know, pretty good estimates of 30,000 or more. And then, then, you know, the daily newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, says that oh, they had 3,000 people. So the numbers are significant um, in this case. And it's very interesting that, in, you know, the very same media outlets that are um, um, so insistent upon underestimating the size of protests here in the U.S., are so generous with gross overestimates of numbers um, when it's in a country that the U.S. is targeting for regime change. So in the, in the past week, and this is not to say that the protests are not significant, they are, but when we get a characterization of mass protests and based on you know, that uh, characterization, then you try to uh, draw conclusions that apply to all the people of Iran, as if there's some kind of a uh, monolithic existence, then it, you know, it, it becomes very difficult. The fact is that the demonstrations that have happened, uh, and it's been a process and it's been in different areas, and it actually has changed characters, as, um, uh, as Ben, you were saying at the beginning, in terms of going, turning into like, uh, armed attacks on um, police stations and so forth. But basically, the turnouts have been quite modest. When you look at the uh, posts on social media, you see protests that have, um, in some instances, just a few people or dozens of people, two at most hundreds. So, you know, massive protests or tens of thousands and things like that that have been characterizations have not been really very accurate. Um, again, I think it's important to look at the protests, the different causes, the different demands, but to make it sound as if, um, you know, uh, the whole society is rising in this narrative of, uh, you know, a dictatorial regime versus the suffering people and the suffering people are rising up and the regime is mowing them down. These uh, oversimplistic characterizations really obfuscate more than clarify what's really going on. Yeah, uh, Mazda, I want to kind of get your take on a narrative that I've been seeing that's kind of emanated from the reformist camp that's more sympathetic to Hassan Rouhani, who's been, you know, at least in the beginning was a target of the protests, uh, which is that they emanated, the protests began, originated in Mashhad, which is a city where uh, controlled by Ibrahim Raisi, uh, who is a close ally of Ahmadinejad and the kind of principalist camp whose father-in-law is an ally of Ahmadinejad, and that, you know, they spun out these protests to put pressure on the reformists because Rouhani had kind of um, rolled back or was attempting to roll back the IRGC's ability to get no-bid contracts and was targeting the religious establishment. So this was kind of an internal battle. And we've seen protests mostly in smaller towns where there's, um, you know, less ability to, uh, you know, repress protests. Um, but they've just been generally small in nature. And then they kind of took a turn for the worse and became violent as external forces, you know, activated their assets. This is, again, you know, a narrative I've been hearing. I'm not you know, stating it as my, my own analysis. Uh, but, you know, first of all, you know, what, what, do you, what do you make of this narrative? I think that's far closer to reality than the typical narrative that we hear in the mainstream media. I would agree yeah. with what you said, Ben, because, I mean, Mashhad and also Qom, the city of Qom, uh, that's uh, spelled Q-O-M, Qom in central Iran, are both... Uh, uh, very religious cities, very traditional uh, sites of pilgrimages for uh, Shia Muslims. And these are not the uh, places where you would expect the same social forces as the Green Movement in 2009 to come out. And it's very clear, and I would agree with what you said, Ben, that at least the beginning in Mashhad and Qom, and at least to some extent in subsequent actions, it was was not a movement for the overthrow of the Islamic Republic. It was a protest to specific policies of the Rouhani administration. And by the way, those actions were not, I mean, the protests do happen in Iran. It's, again, uh, contrary to the false narrative that as soon as people demonstrate in the street, uh, the security forces come and mow them down. That's not the case at all. And the first few protests were went without incident. But what happened was that 
And this is where the role of people who probably have connections to Saudi Arabia, Israel, the U.S. comes in. Because then the, what started out as protests with economic demands turned into, you know, burning down police cars, burning down buildings. And then it, you know, in a matter of a couple of days, it went into armed actions, you know, taking over police stations and attempt to confiscate all their weapons and so forth. So in the course of less than a week, we have uh, really several phenomena to look at and analyze. The, the beginning, which were economic protests, peaceful, and it is related to, uh, you know, the different factions and the effects that the policies have on, uh, you know, working people. And then you have something that goes far beyond that, turns into a call for the overthrow of the regime, has a lot of pro-West and uh, reactionary calls, and then quickly becomes kind of an armed rebellion, in, in, at least in some uh, locations, more than one, certainly. You know, as an American, I have uh, several 155 millimeter howitzer launchers in my basement, <laughs> along with mortar mortar launchers. I have 7.62 millimeter uh, <laughs> automatic uh, anti-tank gun uh, mounted to the top of my Volkswagen GTI. <laughs> um, but, you know, do, that's obviously not true. But do average Iranians have access to weapons, like automatic weapons? That's a very good point. It's uh, th- The answer to that is definitely no. Uh, it's funny because in one instance, uh, when they were reporting on uh, a town in the province of Esfahan, they were saying, oh, there's um, a lot of hunters there. And, you know, <laughs> Esfahan is in the middle of the, almost in the middle of the desert. Uh, I'm not saying there's not hunters. I'm sure there's hunters there and they may have <laughs> or whatever, but it's not like everybody, you know, the U.S. I think is unique in the world in terms of, uh, what is it, uh, you know, 50 million uh, uh, rifles or um, weapons. Yeah, we have more guns in this country than people. That's the real American exceptionalism. But no, it's it's very, very rare for Iranian people to have anything beyond a kitchen knife uh, to uh, do uh, kind of to try to attempt to take over uh, military bases and police stations. So yes, that's the first indication that, you know, the kind of elements that uh, try to um, uh, kind of ch- change uh, protest into armed and armed uprising, you know, have weapons from somewhere else. And you know, very likely, at least some of these elements are agents and so forth. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is you've even seen, you know, traditional allies in former colonial powers like France um, speak out on this. And France has a center right, you know, textbook neoliberal president right now, Macron. He's certainly not some kind of anti-war activist, but even President Macron uh, at a press conference actually criticized the U.S., Israel, and Saudi Arabia, and he he said that they're trying to exploit the protests to lead to war. He said it very openly. I think uh, Macron is inspiring some angry dogs. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. There's a mention of his no, name. It's not, no problem. <laughs> I told Ben that I have these two doggies that sometimes get excited about anything they hear from the streets. So I'm trying to... Uh, control their barking. <laughs> That's all right. I'm a I'm a lover of dogs. I've got a few cats around here that cause trouble. So all these pets are obviously a CIA plot to disrupt us. <laughs> um, but what I was going to say is, so you I mean you even have you know NATO members that are themselves imperial powers like France, who are actually not entirely on board with the attempt to exploit these protests to push for this destabilization. And, of course, we now have even seen that with the rise of these protests, Trump is trying to exploit them to justify actions like like decertifying the nuclear deal. In October, he gave this kind of fire and brimstone speech and just, you know, spread all these lies about Iran. In fact, I wrote an article at Alternate's Gray Zone Project about how in his October speech, Trump blamed Iran for al-Qaeda attacks. And now he's using the protests to continue to justify his policy of ripping up the JCPOA, the nuclear deal. So it's been it's very clear that there are foreign powers that are trying to exploit this. But I'm not so sure how successful it's been. What's your estimate? Well, I mean, you could argue that if if it is in fact true that uh, armed agents working for Saudi Arabia or the Israeli Mossad or the CIA or any combination thereof, if they uh, 
kind of almost immediately within a matter of a couple of days turned it into an armed uprising. I think the effect they might have had was to keep out individuals with various grievances from the streets, from demonstrations that could otherwise have had, you know, economic and uh, political demands. I want to say that uh, when uh, on Sunday night there were reports of several instances of armed attacks, I kind of um, guessed at the time that the, you know, the protest movement would be over because, I mean, the, again, not only is the average person not armed as we've talked about already, but, you know, the average person who wants to go out and protest uh, an increase in prices or a cut in subsidies or uh, protest certain policies of the Rouhani administration is not necessarily going to take part in an action that, you know, turns into uh, an armed attack on police stations and attempting to confiscate more weapons. So, you know, a quick escalation of um, uh, earlier demonstrations, a quick es escalation into uh, uh, basically armed attacks, probably... Um, caused a quick end to uh, uh, what might have been uh, demonstrations that could have gone on for a much longer time. So it seems like uh, as of uh, January 4th, there have not been any significant protests. And on January 5th, Friday, uh, Friday prayers in Tehran and several other cities turned into, uh, again, uh, large protests in support of the Islamic Republic. Uh, so... The claim of the head of the Revolutionary Guard, Jafari, that what he termed as the sedition is over may well be accurate at this point. We also have to mention that even in the middle of the uh, opposition protest, uh, that would be on December 30th, Saturday, um, the only large-scale demonstrations uh, in the last week happened, and that was a demonstration in support of the Islamic Revolution. In fact, it was a demonstration that had been planned for a long time. Ironically, it was uh, the commemoration of a large demonstration in 2009 uh, when, in that instance, the uh, supporters of the Islamic Republic uh, came out and had a massive demonstration. So uh, it seems like the demonstrations, at least at the moment, it seems like they have not uh, continued anymore. Uh, and I think... Uh, um, there's a good possibility that uh, the armed attacks may have had something to do with that. And, you know, in 2009, uh, when you had totally different elements out in the street protesting for what was called the Green Revolution, I mean, you saw massive crowds. What do you have, 16 million people in Tehran? So demonstrations get really big. You didn't see that at any point in Tehran with these demonstrations. Um what you did see, and it's, you know, you, when I say see, it's like people like me who speak English, it comes across your radar on Twitter accounts, which just you for, notice for the first time, which just pop up, which tend to be kind of pro-Shah in orientation. Um, people chanting in support of the Shah. Uh, a banner drop from Maryam Rajavi, the head of the um, Mojahedin al -Kal cult uh or, you know, you have seen these chants, uh, and I, this was, is kind of the most uh, confounding element to me, uh, people chanting against Iranian uh, support for Gaza, Iranian, the, the Iranian role in Syria, and Iranian support for Hezbollah. So I guess, uh, what do you make of first the last part, these chants? I mean, where do they emanate from? And how much do they reflect an authentic, organic sentiment? Uh, I think that's a that's a very good point. I mean, those chants apparently have happened. There were several reports of chants happening, not, not Gaza, not Lebanon, I give my life for Iran. And also another variant of that, not Gaza, not Lebanon, sacrifice both for Iran. You know, they're very chauvinistic. Uh, Iran is the best. Iran is the number one, that kind of a thing, which... You know, our U.S. audience can relate to this kind of a thing since we're uh, exposed to, the, to it uh, all the time. Yeah, this is an important point. Some Western media outlets have been constantly reiterating that protesters are chanting, not Gaza, not Lebanon, I'll give my life for Iran. And what they're trying to do is imply that Iranians do not support the Iranian government's foreign policy. 
And this is, of course, the main problem that the U.S. and its allies have with Iran. They don't care that Rouhani... They don't care that the Iranian government has, you know, implemented neoliberal policies or oppresses its people. They really care what its foreign policy is. And Amo Saad, who's a Lebanese professor who does an amazing analysis of different conflicts in the Middle East, she pointed to a recent poll conducted by the University of Maryland Center for International Security Studies. And this poll asked average Iranians what would be acceptable, uh, what policy would be acceptable to do in return for lifting sanctions on Iran. And 66%, two-thirds of Iranians said that it would absolutely be unacceptable for Iran to recognize Israel in return for lifting sanctions. And only 13% said that would be acceptable. So again, this is, uh, Iran's pro-Palestinian policies and opposition to Israel is a very popular policy in Iran that's not unpopular. Other things that they tested in this University of Maryland poll, they asked Iranians how many people would support stopping Iranian support for Hezbollah. And 59% of Iranians said that would be unacceptable, and only 18% said that it would be acceptable. And then also the poll asked if it would be acceptable for Iran to stop supporting the Syrian government in return for lifting sanctions, and 58% said that would be unacceptable, and only 18% said it would be acceptable. So again, there's a lot to critique about the Iranian government, there's no question, and, and it has a lot of, you know, right-wing policies that, I, that we should oppose, but when it comes to its foreign policy, it's actually very popular among the Iranian people, and of course, Western media outlets are emphasizing these small fringe groups that are chanting these kinds of chauvinistic slogans and implying that this is a wider sentiment among the Iranian population when it actually isn't. You know, it, 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 it builds on a continuation of propaganda uh, that goes into Iran through satellite TV channels, um, mainly Voice of America, BBC, which have a large, large following. And for years, they've been propagating this idea that the main source of uh, economic problems in Iran is the fact that Iran just gives so much to Gaza and then later to Damascus and to Yemen and so forth. There's, uh, you know, rumors of uh, truckloads of solid gold having been seen being shipped to Gaza and so forth. And these outrageous claims. But it does show that at least the... Um, demonstration in 2009 for sure and in at least in some instances this year uh, it points to you know what happens when there's a lack of a revolutionary or even progressive leadership to the movement um, Max when you point out the supports um, that support that is expressed for the Shah or the Shah's son or the monarchy or the MK or MEK uh, organization, which has become really like a kind of a CIA asset. Yeah, an obvious asset. And obvious, they're not even hiding it anymore. Their main task is to try to collect intelligence data, but, uh, you know, purported nuclear sites and feed it to the CIA and so forth. And, and not even just the CIA, you have politicians, you know, senators, Congress people who go and speak at events that were organized by MEK and they'll stand next to MEK officials. Yeah, Rudolf Giuliani is the, the hero of that. I mean, they, they used him several times. I want to express my support for Mariam Rajavi. <laughs> She's very, very good. She wants to free Iran and replace uh, this evil regime with another autocrat who loves Israel. I'm Rudy. G How do you? I don't know if you like my Giuliani. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I've been hanging out with Randy Credico too much. But anyway, continue. Let me add really quickly, just for listeners who don't know, um, because there's a lot of discussion of MEK in Western media, but there's not really much discussion of what the MEK is. I mean, this is a cult. All the members of MEK have to be celibate, and if they're married, they have to divorce their spouses, and they have to declare an oath on the Quran to the Rajavi family that controls MEK. And uh, they have very strange policies, very right-wing policies. You know, they used to have economic policies that were more progressive, but in the past s several decades, now they actually are just completely neoliberal. They do not want anything different economically. And in, in terms of their social policies, too, you know, there are a lot of very justified criticisms of the Iranian government, which is not a left-wing government. You know, it represses the rights of women. It, it really represses the left and the rights of workers. This is all something that shouldn't be controversial. This is absolutely true. But the thing about the MEK is they don't propose any kind of alternative to that. In fact, it could be worse. 
so for instance, as, as a highlight of this, there have been many Western liberals who have rightfully condemned the Iranian government's repression of women, again, which is a very important and valid criticism. But then these same Western liberals also strongly support the MEK, but the MEK also has very misogynist policies and has for many years practiced strict segregation of gender. So again, we see all these double standards where these Western opposition groups that have links to the U.S. government are held up as, you know, the, the benevolent opposition when they themselves are even more reactionary than the Iranian government. And they've been the face of the protests, uh, you know, internationally um, in Rome and Paris, where they have lobbying offices. MEK also has a lobbying office in Washington. They've been putting the resources behind these protests calling for regime change. So this is not really, you know, a group with a constituency inside Iran that I know of. In fact, uh, you know, it's also been widely reported in mainstream outlets that the MEK was behind the assassinations we saw of Iranian scientists in the run-up to the JCPOA, which were carried out in coordination with Israeli intelligence. But Mazda, I mean, return to your point about, you know, the MEK's presence um, along with the pro-Shah monarchist elements in the protest. And I'm glad that we're discussing this, and that's part of the discussion that is sorely lacking in the analysis of much of the, you know, progressive organizations in the U.S., is that they uncritically assume that every time someone goes into the streets, whether it's the 2009 free movement or everything else is progressive, and the fact that right now in this discussion we're talking about the actual alternatives, actual political forces, is very significant and it should be an important part of our analytical tools. I mean, when we are looking at the Tea Party in the U.S. or the alt-right, I mean, they may be opposition, but they're, you know, obviously ultra-right opposition. And so we don't defend them, we don't stand with them. And when it comes to Iran, I mean, uh, just like it was said, I mean, the Mojahed Dean, the Shah, the monarchists, and so forth, are far to the right of the Islamic Republic. And um, many of, you know, they're for, like, wide-scale privatizations. They're for opening the markets to multinational corporations, removing whatever uh, protections there are of the national industries and so forth, removing the social safety net that gives some levels of benefit or protect protection to the poor, Therefore, removing all of that stuff and jumping into the abyss headfirst of neoliberal policy. So, uh, when we're looking at um, uh, you know opposition movements, we have to look at the forces that are there. We can't just like declare anyone with any any actions with legitimate grievances to be revolutionary or progressive. Yes, there are very many legitimate grievances in the Iranian society, but we also have to look at the character of the opposition forces. And of course, it is possible in due time that, uh, you know, protests and, uh, uh, you know, progressive uh, goals will be able to organize themselves in the form of uh, progressive and revolutionary parties. But right now what we have is uh, the monarchist, the Shah and his family, the Prince Reza Pahlavi and so forth, and the MEK, those are the main forces. And even those are not a real existence in Iran other than in the form of individual elements and in the form of ubiquitous uh, uh, propaganda through satellite channels and so forth. Well, I, I just think for listeners um, who aren't totally plugged into the details of Iranian internal affairs or the geopolitics of the situation. I think it's important to just talk about what regime change would mean and why the uh, Trump-Israeli-Saudi axis is so dead set on using these actors that we've been discussing to promote it. I mean, what would it mean for Iran and for the region? I mean, what 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 is the what is the is you know Islamic Republic represent? especially, uh, you know, throughout the region. I think that's what we need to get at for listeners who aren't, you know, completely plugged into the minutia. Sure. I mean, part of that has to do with, again, like the level of propaganda that exists here. Makes it sound like we have a nation of millions who are all going hungry and homeless, and yeah. therefore anything that happens is a positive development. 
And one of the things that uh, we need to emphasize, and I tried to do that in a, in a piece of writing about the recent developments, uh, is to talk, talk about the economy. And I think uh, it's uh, very easy to see coverage by, you know, the CNN and Fox and the U.S. Uh, State Department and Trump's tweets, all of them kind of agreeing um, as a starting point that Iran's economy is falling apart, it's in a crisis, it's about to collapse, all this kind of stuff. Yet, uh, when you actually look at the economy, none of that stuff is true. I mean, there's World Bank data that suggests that Iran's economy has actually been growing over the past year and a half, two years, since the sanctions were removed, or at least partially removed. Uh, unemployment rate is is still very high, but the level of people living below the poverty line has gone down to something like 7.5%. And so when you have the assumption of the analysis that people are all going hungry and so forth, uh, then it doesn't sound like it's much of a danger for Iran to go full neoliberal. But, I mean, we have to keep in mind that even the U.S., you know, the richest country in the world, we have official numbers of 14.5%. Uh, below the poverty line. And Iran, before the revolution, uh, when the Shah was in power and when the wealth of the country was being robbed by, you know, oil companies and multinational corporations, uh, you know, 55 percent of the population lived below the poverty line. And I know that that's a complete contrast to the picture we're getting. People who are supposedly living in peace and prosperity until the revolution happened. But the fact is there was widespread poverty and poverty is far, far more limited now than it was before. And you can see that clearly when you visit not just uh, uh, Tehran or, you know, the southern parts of Tehran, the usually working class areas of Tehran, but when you go out into the provinces, um, as a result of the revolution and the process that it unleashed, uh, I mean, uh, the bottom has been raised for a significant part of the population. And in fact, part of the ongoing conflicts that are happening is to what extent uh, should the programs that benefit the poor be continued or even expanded, or to what extent should they be uh, kind of limited uh, with a move towards the more traditional capitalist uh, economy with more privatizations and so forth. Yeah, and this is an interesting point that it's a good transition that I wanted to get at. Mazda, you wrote an excellent piece in Liberation News. It's called What to Make of Iran's Demonstrations. Uh, we'll link to it in the show notes for this episode. And you you unpack, you know, in this kind of nuanced analysis of what's happening. And as you addressed earlier, um, in terms of Iran's economy, one of the points you stress is that, no, Iran's economy is not falling apart. There's not, you know, massive starvation and poverty. However, I mean, one of the points you also stress is that, well, poverty has decreased since the 79 revolution. And it's it's important to stress that, the 79 revolution is referred to as the Islamic revolution, but there were also, you know, many leftist groups, socialists, you know, unfortunately in the late 80s, many of them were repressed by the Iranian government, and we can maybe get into that later. But, you know, this was a revolution against, uh, of course, a Western-backed Shah. It was a revolution against imperialism, but in the early days, there were also leftist elements. And in the decades since, it seems to me, the impression I get is that neoliberalism has become more and more dominant. And by neoliberalism, we of course mean the latest stage of so-called free market capitalism that came to dominate the world after the end of the Cold War. And in your ar article, you point out that certainly there have been some layers of social support and poverty has decreased, but at the same time, as, as you stress, as in any capitalist society, and Iran is a capitalist society, there still has emerged a layer of the super rich. And you, you know, you write, quote, they drive around in $100,000 cars, live in unimaginably opulent mansions that have elevators for their automobiles, and dress in fashionable clothes comparable to Hollywood celebrities, end quote. And of course, you know, every capitalist society has this class. It's the capitalist class. This is not unique to Iran, but it is, it is a contradiction that I think we have to unpack a bit. And the impression I get from following Iranian politics is that Rouhani has definitely pursued some 
progressive policies. But at the same time, he also seems to be pursuing some economic neoliberal policies, privatization, etc. And it seems that part of the contradiction going on here between the reformists and the principalists and part of the um, you know, conditions that gave rise to these protests at first, you know, before they became violent, was an opposition to some of these neoliberal policies. What do you think? I think I, I agree with everything that you said. You know, the picture is very complicated. I mean, the thing that happened after the revolution uh, and in the years of the eight years of the Iran-Iraq war is that the economy went through a severe contraction. I mean, after the war ended, uh, industrial or actually economic output was less than half of what it had been uh, 10 years earlier when the revolution happened. Yet in that period, uh, because as you mentioned, Ben, the revolution was, um, uh, I mean, there were a lot of leftist forces that participated in the revolution, but even among the Islamic forces, the idea of social justice, the idea of eliminating poverty was a major factor. And even to this day, it's very interesting. When you look at the super rich uh, showing off their wealth, when it happens in the U.S., thanks to, you know, decades of propaganda uh, about the super rich being uh, good entrepreneurs and being smarter than the rest of us. and The rebel billionaire. Yeah, the rebel billionaire, all this kind of stuff. I mean, these people don't feel like they need to hide anything. And the system holds them up as examples of what happens when you're really smart and take good chances, even though in reality, none of that is true. But here, it's we watch the lifestyles of the rich and famous on TV. In Iran, still nearly 40 years after the revolution, uh, no one defends the idea that someone could be so super rich where their cars ride an elevator in their home. And, you know, uh, so because it seems to run counter to the goals of the revolution. But anyway, going back to the time of the, of the Iran-Iraq war, even though the economy had contracted severely, Government controls made sure that what little there was was distributed equitably. There was a time in Iran that even if you were rich, you could not buy, you know, uh, like a whole chicken because it was so limited. You'd have to stand in line with your, uh, you know, uh, food coupons and so forth and get what your share was, which may have been, you know, 100 grams or 150 grams a week or whatever the case was. This is when the war was going on. And following the end of the war, I wouldn't call it like fully full on neoliberal policies, because still, even to this day, 30 years after the war and almost 40 years after the revolution, the state sector is quite sizable, about 60 percent of the economy. But privatizations have happened. And um, the Rouhani administration wants at, at least at a, at a slow pace uh, to expand some privatizations. Um, and reduce uh, the role of subsidies in the economy. Yeah, and related to that, maybe you can unpack this contradiction. One of the things I've noticed that, that is uh, rather unique um, and certainly different from you know these Western capitalist-oriented political systems is that in Iran... For, for listeners who aren't familiar, there are, you know, this is a lazy distinction that's made, but it's, it's frequent. There are two main political factions, the reformists and the principalists. The principalists are also known as the conservatives. And from looking at some of their rhetoric and policies, it seems to me that the principalists... The principalists, by the way, uh, you know, for an American audience, they're referred to almost ubiquitously uh, and universally as hardliners in the U.S., which is just kind of a, a <laughs> propagandistic term. And yet we don't call Republicans hardliners. Like, what is Jeff Sessions if not an extreme hardliner uh, who also happens to look like a baby? But um, <laughs> <laughs> if you look, for instance, at Ahmadinejad, and of course, there are even different factions within the principalists, but Ahmadinejad, who on cultural policies, you know, you, I would say is, is pretty right wing. But when it came to economic policies, Ahmadinejad actually pursued a, a kind of left leaning populist agenda. He increased uh, subsidies for food and, and fuel. Um, he promised to build millions of homes. And he actually criticized capitalism a lot. And what's interesting to me is that it seems that the reformists, you know, you said that they're not full on neoliberals. But they're much less anti-capitalist, at least compared to someone like Ahmadinejad. So 
to Westerners, you know, to those of us living in Western capitalist bourgeois democracies, where left-wing politics and economics in particular are associated with left-wing progressive social policies like feminism, anti-racism, pro-LGBT rights, etc., it seems like that's not exactly the same in Iran. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that contradiction? Um, actually, uh, it's it's not often that I'm uh, interviewed where the interviewer uh, is even aware of these contradictions. Uh, ben, I appreciate the point that you made. <laughs> it's one of the contradictions that's actually very difficult to deal with. And I'm what I'm going to say is uh, essentially a restating of what you said because like the Ahmadinejad fraction of the principalists or the hardliners, as the Westerners would like to call them, tend to be progressive on issues having to do with the economy, believe in uh, placing, you know, significant restrictions on capital, believe in uh, pretty wide programs uh, to benefit the poor and the working class. And, you know, like the huge housing projects uh, that are only... Uh, where their houses, completed houses, are only given to low-income uh, citizens. And these are all very progressive things that, you know, any progressive around the world would defend. However, that comes in a package of um, cultural uh, reactionary backwardness. And so the principalists tend to be, although Ahmadinejad was kind of mild in that area, most other principalists are uh, much more um, strict on their interpretations of Shia Islam and their implementation in society on issues like women's rights and so forth. But generally speaking, the uh, principalists uh, tend to be more reactionary on cultural issues. And that's a contradiction because also, and then on the other hand, people like Rouhani and Khatami, the you know, uh, president before Ahmadinejad, tend to be more progressive in terms of uh, loosening cultural rules and uh, more access to women uh, in terms of, um, well, I shouldn't say more access to women because women have had good access to jobs and education. Up to 60% of uh, college graduates are women. Especially in STEM, which is not very well known. Uh, but still, the restrictions, the enforced um, uh, hijab rules and other uh, limitations that exist People like Rouhani tend to be more progressive on those issues. However, they tend to be more for uh, a typical capitalist uh, uh, society. Albeit, we have to distinguish, though, that even the Rouhani faction that has wanted to um, decrease tensions with the U.S. and so forth, they are not advocates of full-on neoliberalism if we understand neoliberalism to have a strong component of uh, removing uh, barriers and kind of inviting uh, multinational capital to come in and take over. But yes, they're very much for um, uh, kind of reducing, at least somewhat reducing the role of the state sector and the strengthening of the private sector. So there's those contradictions where, uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, we need to talk about, and I'm glad we're talking about it now, is that uh, even when you're talking about the factions, things don't line up neatly. And even within the principalist, uh, there's also a spectrum of forces, um, the best of which would be the Ahmadinejad forces, who were for, who was and is for, uh, you know, more benefits and social safety nets for the poor. And then there's the right wing of the principalists, who are the kind of the bazaar or the market faction, who are not so much for, you know, benefits for the poor, but, um, you know, normal functioning, quote, normal functioning of the markets. So it's a very complicated picture. So something, you know, I, I noticed even, you know, being in occupied Palestine is that regardless of what any faction anyone uh, subscribes to, the idea of not having universal health care, of having, not having free health care is just unfathomable. Um, and you look at Iran, you know, you have all these different factions, you have a mixed economy, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, like kind of 65% of the economy is public or controlled by the state. And, you know, you, you start work at 16, you can retire at 48 and have cash subsidies paid into your account. I mean, you, you have kind of a system set up that people are dependent on that we would kind of recognize in the U.S. as radical socialism, um, and people don't want to lose it. Um, another thing I noticed is that these attacks on banks, 
um, in Iran. There were dozens of attacks on banks when the protests started turning violent, focused on state-owned banks. I think only, only one private bank was attacked. Um, so there was some clear attempt to sabotage that aspect of the state. Um, what does the International Monetary Fund, the international finance system, want to get out of this? I mean, is, is there pressure on Iran from the outside uh, to kind of roll back the state-oriented economy that people have been depending on? And is that a factor in the push for regime change? Uh, well, I think it's uh, it's widely reported that the IMF, and in particular the World, World Bank, has been in Iran, has done reports, and is largely uh, agreeing with the process that Rouhani is presenting. Uh, so as far as that goes, it could be said, I think at a kind of at a superficial level that uh, Rouhani is the, uh, you know, the darling of the neoliberal politics. And again, like 10 years from now, this may or may not be true. But at this point, I mean, what we're looking at is, for example, a subsidy system where 90%, 90% of the population receives cash subsidies. Uh, that's money that the government deposits into your bank account. Uh, this started out as a program that was supposed to go to 10% of the lowest income individuals. And as a result of, you know, many factors, most uh, prominent of which was the fact that uh, Islamic Republic didn't really want to risk uh, alienating any parts of the population, essentially let everyone get in, you know, and, and get those state subsidies. So part of the uh, reduction of the subsidies that we're talking about is not uh, the, type, the type of cuts that we see from the ultra right wing of the U.S. ruling class, the Trump and their ilk trying to uh, cut uh, like food for uh, poor children and so forth. It's trying to reduce that 90 percent to a lower percentages or something that, in my opinion, is worse, is to reduce the amount rather than reducing the percentage of, you know, well-to-do individuals who are receiving the subsidies. Um, so it's, uh, you know, the, the IMF and the World Bank have, uh, you know, presented a program for making the economy more efficient in their words and efficient in their words is privatization. But with 60, 65 percent of the economy being state owned, Iran right now is long, long away from a point where we could talk about really, uh, you know, full fledged neoliberal set of policies where every state owned thing becomes privatized and, uh, you know, uh, people are laid off in, in the millions. Yeah. And just a, just a quick correction. Uh, Trump's policy was to feed poor children to the rich as donor <laughs> kebab. So, um, you know, we just need to keep the facts straight here. But can, can I, can I, uh, that's actually not true, but can I uh, ask, uh, you know, just what, what do you think the role of sanctions has been in driving economic grievances? I know it made the economy contract, um, but... You know, the money is said to be flowing back into Iran. So is this a real factor? Well, I mean, the sanctions have been a real fact of life really since the revolution of 1979. I mean, the sanctions in the early years were even far more uh, damaging than they are now because at the time of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, of course, the Iraqi military was getting uh, huge aid from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, and uh, and the, and the U.S. And Iran's military uh, was virtually all uh, U.S. manufactured weapons because, you know, the Shah had been in power and the Shah was a U.S. Uh, client and pretty much every military piece of hardware that he bought was the U.S. So the government after the revolution could not even find any way to get their weapons to work other than through third party intermediaries and so forth just for the, for the war effort. Um, then the sanctions, I mean, continued and it reached their peak in 2013, 2014, when Iran was effectively locked out of the um, international trade system. They could not buy and sell anything other than through barter, which also meant that they could not sell the oil. I mean, oil production and oil export fell to about a third of what they had been before the uh, uh, imposition of the more uh, stringent sanctions. 
So it's very interesting in the case of Iran, and we also see that in the case of a number of other countries that are targeted by the U.S., is that the U.S. and their allies impose strict sanctions, uh, which drives the economies to the ground and imposes hardship on people. And then the next propaganda line is that you see these leaders are so incompetent that they, you know, drive the people into hunger and poverty. Whereas, the, in fact, it is the anticipated and intended goal of the sanctions to drive them into poverty. Right. Yeah. And what's what's interesting about this narrative that really infuriates me, and it just shows how out of touch and how just simply false a lot of Western media reporting is. When we're talking about the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is the official name of the Iran nuclear deal, people in, in the U.S., almost universally speak of it as a deal between the U.S. and Iran, as if there were no other members or parties to the agreement. But in reality, it was Iran and the five permanent members of the Security Council, which is the U.S., China, Russia, France, U.K., and then plus one, also Germany. So whenever we have a discussion of the Iran nuclear deal and U.S. sanctions, which are unilateral, we frequently just narrow the discussion to what the U.S. and Iran have to say and ignore the fact that, again, France, U.K., China, Russia, and Germany also negotiated this agreement and all continue to strongly support the nuclear deal. They're doing a ton of business with Iran, and they are not on board with this regime change agenda, as you pointed out with Macron's statement. Absolutely. Well, and then in addition to that, another layer of deception that is, you know, portrayed in a lot of this rhetoric is the idea that with the JCPOA, with that signed in 2015, that suddenly U.S. sanctions ended on Iran. No, that is ridiculous. You know, as we alluded to earlier, only nuclear-related sanctions ended. So the U.S. still has pretty significant sanctions on the Iranian economy. And then, of course, since Trump entered office last January, he has continued to ex expand those sanctions. And uh, some experts say that he actually may even be violating the JCPOA, which he has pledged to tear up. So there's frequently, you know, no perspective on the fact that the, it is tr that the U.S. is very clearly the aggressor when it comes to these sanctions. And, you know, as you mentioned, they go back decades. But particularly in the past few years, even when Obama was in office, you know, people portrayed this as if the U.S. was bending over backward and as if, you know, Obama was just acquiescing and, and giving Iran all this money. There's this right wing talking point of, oh, uh, the, the socialist Muslim Obama gave billions of dollars of free money to Iran. But this is incredibly misleading. And, and that wasn't even American money. <laughs> So the, the point to stress here is that this is actually a very moderate policy that was supported by the entire international community, including the five permanent members of the Security Council and Germany. And it is the U.S. that is the one that is rejecting the deal unilaterally and failing on its obligations. Right. And the billions of dollars that Obama purportedly gave to Iran were Iran's own assets. That the U.S. stole. It wasn't Obama's to give. They were frozen assets, which were unfrozen as a result of them. I want to say also that, uh, you know, the result of the part of the effects of the sanctions, which continue to this day, is that, you know, even though officially the sanctions are over, but the fact that even like uh, under Obama, uh, there was not a serious effort to uh, give reassurances to U.S. and other international capital to go in for investments. And, of course, with the elections, uh, I think, you know, big capital definitely wants uh, to have assurances of safety for its investments. So I think... Uh, why Iran needs uh, significant investments in its, especially in its offshore um, oil sector. I think the, you know, uh, big conglomerates uh, were hedging their bets to see what happens with the U.S. elections. And with uh, Trump's ongoing, um, uh, you know, failure to uh, recertify the JCPOA or Iran's compliance with the JCPOA, and also like uh, highly uh, uh, hostile statements, it's still made the effect of the lifting of the sanctions far less than it would have been. Because uh, on the one hand, the sanctions officially are lifted. And just like you said, Ben, that's only the part of the sanctions that uh, were directly related to the nuclear issue. And yes, Iran can sell oil and can trade on the international markets. 
Well, it's still far from a situation where, uh, uh, you know, some of these companies may want to go into Iran because no telling what's going to happen in six months or a year. And uh, these these corporations are not going to take that chance. I will add to this the the problem in terms of uh, foreign investment is that uh, Iran has a rule where um, you know foreign investment has to happen, but fifty one percent of the investment has to be uh, domestically owned. So that creates a major inconvenience for the major corporations as well. I mean, from my perspective, it's a it's a progressive thing that uh, helps development and keeps the resources uh, and the markets of the country from being uh, robbed by the multinational corporations. But it's uh, it's a deterrent for uh, foreign investment as far as that goes. So we're winding down on time here, but toward the end, one of the things I wanted to acknowledge, just to think about it, because it's something that could be very troubling, are the parallels with what's happening right now in Iran and the parallels with what happened in Syria. You know, I really hope that Iran doesn't have anything even close to resembling the horrific, unfathomable tragedy that Syria and millions of Syrians have gone through. But of course, you can't help but notice that there are a lot of striking parallels. So for instance, in early 2011, when protests first began in Syria, there were certainly a many legitimate demands and legitimate protests against government policies, you know, against repression, against many of the neoliberal economic policies that have been implemented. There is actually a drought, which is not mentioned a lot. But at the same time, which of course was not stressed by Western media outlets, you also had very reactionary right wing Islamist elements in the opposition from the very beginning. And of course, those extremely reactionary elements, which were supported by foreign powers, you know, by the US and its proxies, those were the ones that came to dominate the opposition. And by the time the conflict was militarized and it became a war fueled by multiple international powers, there was no hope of any kind of progressive change happening. And the initial protests were, at this point, really irrelevant in the context of a larger imperialist conflict and war, extremely brutal war inside the country. And, you know, we've seen in Iran that certainly there have been legitimate protests against some of these policies, but we've also seen, you know, the reactionary factions of people chanting, uh, we are Aryans, we are not Arabs, uh, we are not Muslims, etc. And we've seen, of course, the pro-Shah, we talked about the MEK faction. So if this does escalate, I mean, I think we should be very clear that it is not in any way hyperbolic or conspiratorial to talk about U.S. involvement in Iran, because, of course, the CIA has a very long history in the country. In 1953, of course, the U.S. overthrew Iran's democratic elected government of Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh on behalf of British Petroleum, which was then known as the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company before rebranding as BP later. And even in the past few years, we've seen significant CIA operations. In fact, when Trump entered office, there was a massive spike, and the New York Times published an, an, a very interesting article in June titled, CIA Names the Dark Prince to Run Iran Operations, Signaling a Tougher Stance. And it talks about how under Trump, and particularly under Mike Pompeo, the new CIA director, who is a virulent longtime anti-Iran hawk, there is now a new program run by someone who is really nicknamed, this is not a joke, he's nicknamed the Dark Prince. They also call him Ayatollah Mike. And, you know, he's he worked with the CIA for, for many years, and now he's heading this new Iran program. His name's Michael D'Andrea. And Wall Street Journal also published an article, and it's called CIA Creates New Mission Center to Turn Up Heat on Iran. And then it says Trump administration moves to make Middle Eastern country a high priority target for American spies. So I, I just think listeners, you know, I'm not in any way implying that all these protesters are CIA stooges, etc. No, I mean... There certainly have been legitimate protests, but we need to be very clear that this is a well-documented, concerted public effort by the Trump administration to ramp up CIA involvement in the country. And if things do escalate violently, I mean, it is not in any way a stretch to, to uh, stress the very negative role that the U.S. could be playing. Yeah, uh, just if I could quickly jump in just to uh, note uh, an interesting development, which was that Stuart Baker, who's a former Department of Homeland Security official, published a call for the CIA to actually support uh, what you could call moderate rebels <laughs> inside Iran to use improvised explosive devices to carry out terror attacks and raise the cost 
on uh, the Iranian government. Um, and the reaction was really notable. It was published on Lawfare, which is the website of Benjamin Witz, who's national security lawyer whose job in life is to kind of be the CIA's water boy. <laughs> and the outrage that was inspired by this um, article prompted Wits to actually publish an apology. And I thought that was really notable because what Baker was calling for in Iran was less than what the U.S. did in Syria, where it actually armed and trained with advanced weaponry, like heavy weaponry, uh, the allies of Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, the Free Syrian Army, which essentially folded into Al-Qaeda. So, you know, a lot of the people criticizing Baker and lawfare were uh, some of the same people who supported that policy uh, that actually took place in Syria. So, you know, that that's an interesting development. And I think for Iranians, the Syrian experience and the Arab Spring in general has been instructive. And the lesson is don't let your protests be exploited by the outside and turn violent because your entire society will be destabilized and your economy will be reduced to nothing. Uh, Mazda, I guess, you know, take it from there. Uh, what do you see happening next? And what do you make of, you know, this a uh, analysis of the protests? Well, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I agree with what you guys have been saying. I mean, the problem is that uh, U.S. administration now has a lot of, like, far-right elements that don't quite understand that you do these things, but you don't quite uh, talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is not what he's proposing. The problem is that these things, you keep them outside of the public sphere. I mean, U.S. policy towards Iran, as uh, Ben was saying earlier, I mean, a lot of people don't notice, or, you know, it's mentioned in passing, yeah, the 1953 CIA coup. I mean, again, we have to emphasize that was not a coup that was supported by the CIA. That was a coup that was organized by the CIA itself. Mm -hmm. And it overthrew parliamentary democracy in Iran and put in power as an absolute monarch with absolute powers, the Shah. And, you know, the people who run U.S. policy are very clear about what they're doing. And, of course, in their public statements, they talk about human rights and democracy and, you know, whatever else. Uh, but in, in the case of Syria, in the case of Iraq, in other cases, it's very clear they want to remove any uh, states with any level of independence from Washington, any state that provides any kind of um, impediment or obstacle in the way of, of uh, international capital, uh, you know, multinational capital. They want to remove independent states. And, you know, the uh, excuses or pretexts that they use are real or perceived uh, violations of human rights or violations of democratic rights and so forth, but they have no interest in uh, democracy or, or human rights. They have an interest in expanding, uh, you know, the markets and uh, access to free or very cheap resources of the neo-colonized world. And for that, they will do anything. So, uh, the pro problem that they have with Iran is that whereas in Al-Qaeda and ISIS they have a uh, kind of ready-made package that can serve their interests in some instances, and they've had a lot, I'm not actually suggesting that they've uh, directly created or controlled ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but it's certainly true in the case of um, Syria is a good example. The case historically of Afghanistan is another good example where the U.S. does take advantage of these kinds of forces uh, to promote its uh, interest. Uh, and there's no question that the U.S. and its allies have seen al-Qaeda, Jabhat al-Nusra in the case of Syria, and Daesh or um, uh, ISIS in Syria to their advantage. And there's no question that they have uh, shown an alliance or support for them as as opposed to the secular state of Bashar Assad. In the case of Iran, that's probably going to be less possible because Iran is a majority Shia country and uh, the kind of forces that Al-Qaeda and ISIS have, they kind of see Shia as uh, not even uh, Muslims, not even followers of Islam. So at least in that form, their ideology and their force cannot spread in Iran. But that's not to say that if they had an opportunity, they would not create some sort of an armed force in Iran to try to get the country to descend into uh, 
chaos and armed conflict and uh, civil war and anything of that nature. I think that's a good note to end on. You know, just to conclude and, and kind of go over some of the things we talked about. I mean, it's just, it's just very important for listeners to understand that, you know, certainly there are a lot of criticisms and reactionary policies of the Iranian government, but the idea that the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Israel, especially Saudi Arabia, which is exponentially worse than Iran in so many ways, the idea that they would actually support a more progressive force in Iran that would counteract some of the Iranian government's reactionary policies is outlandish. And there is no historical example to date of this happening. Every time the U.S. supports regime change and overthrowing a government in the Middle East, and not even just the Middle East, throughout much of the world, it leads to a much, not only more right-wing and reactionary situation, but a more violent situation in which countless people lose their lives, are crushed in poverty and exploitation. So yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly... At the same time, important to recognize that there are legitimate protests going on, but the potential of them being co-opted and exploited is is very serious. So, Mazda, I mean, I, I thank you uh, for joining us. I think we had an excellent discussion. We, we covered a lot here at Moderate Rebels, and hopefully we can have you again sometime soon. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mazda. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure to be on, and I am uh, very, very pleased to have been on a program where... Uh, the hosts are so aware and so conscious of what is going on that I, you know, played an insignificant role because you guys knew everything in terms of the context and the historical background and the analysis of what's going on. So it was a pleasure to be on, on, on this podcast. Well, my ego is exploding, but uh, I'm glad we've <laughs> formed a mutual admiration society and we'll continue it into the future uh, for future uh, Moderate Rebels episodes. Well, and I learned a lot from you too, Mazda, so thanks a lot. Okay, thank you guys. Have a good day. You too. You too. Thanks for listening to Moderate Rebels. As always, we will have show notes for our episode and our website is moderaterebelsradio.com. If you would like to support what we're doing here at Moderate Rebels, and if you'd like to gain access to exclusive content, please consider subscribing at our Patreon page. That is patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And of course, we're on social media. We're on Twitter at Moderate Radio, and we're on Facebook at Moderate Rebels Radio. Thanks for listening. <laughs>